Tendera Temple is one of the most complete temples in Egypt, which structure helps in studying the factors that compose an ancient Egyptian temple. To begin with, all the main parts of the temple are situated on one axis that divides it by a splendid straight way that starts from the entrance until the sanctuary. This was a way used by the king to the God's Chapel and a way taken by the statue of the God on the shoulders of the priests outside the temple to welcome the king or to visit other gods in their temples. The religious ceremonies and the visits of the gods and goddesses to each other were important traditions in the Egyptian religion. The walk of the procession had to be straight, starting from the sanctuary and all the way out of the temple, especially if part of the rituals included carrying the statue of the god in a boat surrounded by priests and high officials. As a procession advanced in the passage, doors were closed behind it and doors were opened in front of it. The high priest was dressed in a tiger leather coat. Other priests wore wide white dresses and sandals. They were all bold, meaning that they shaved all their bodies for purity. The front open court of the temple is the widest part in it. The ancient Egyptians called it Weshet Habit, which means the festival's hall. Its design serves well the purpose of its construction, as it was built for the gathering of the people who participated in the religious ceremonies of the god. Like the festival of the entrance and exit of the sacred bark and the coronation of the king and his transfiguration on known occasions. Some of the rituals of the Jubilee Hapset festival were celebrated in the open court, where the axis reaches its final point. When the king ordered a new temple to be built for a god, the preparations of holding special rituals started right away. They were concerned with the foundation of the temple, so they waited until the moon became a crescent on one of the months of season Beret, which is winter, that started from the middle of November and until the half of March. The rituals start with the arrival of the king or the queen to the perfectly selected grounds of the temple and after it was leveled and cleaned and prepared with all the tools and equipments and offerings needed for these rituals. The different stages of the foundation rituals of the temple start with the king accompanied by a priestess that represents Goddess Sishat, the goddess of writing. They determine the temple's area by fixing four wedges or sticks in the four corners from north to south, then from east to west. Then, with the help of Goddess Sishat, he stretches a rope between the four marks. This ritual is known as stretching the rope. Then, the king places the foundation deposits in holes that contain clean sand in each corner of the temple and below the doors and below its outer walls. These deposits include seeds, oils, fruits and meat. In addition to small miniatures of the tools on which the king's name is written, these items were considered offerings to protect the building from evil spirits and to attract to it the good spirits. These are parts of the rituals that were applied before building a temple in ancient Egypt. For both the spiritual and the materialistic elements combined together, 
to compose such great buildings that enlightened the ancient civilization. to the front of the pier of Karnak Temple through a narrow channel. That's where the processions of the king throughout thousands of years sailed and docked, and the trumpets played announcing the beginnings of the rituals of the pharaoh's reception. The pier was used until the 26th dynasty, as traces of that era were found. On its side that faces the river, Marks that showed the different levels of the floods were recorded. These marks belong to the period between the 21st and the 26th dynasty. In the middle of the pier, there is a square base, maybe for placing the sacred bark of Amon. It was called Usirhat, made of cedar wood and coated with gold. It was used in the great festivals when the god sailed from Karnak's pier to visit his wife Goddess Mut in Luxor temple. The pier was high in the front and descended until it reached the level of the avenue that leads to the first pylon and is adorned on both sides with rams. northeast and southeast corners, two obelisks made of red sandstone were erected. The one that still exists goes back to King Seti II's era. The Avenue of Rams lies between two rows of statues. Each of them is composed of a ram's head and a lion's body. The avenue is 52 meters long and 13 meters wide. It's 20 meters away from the first pylon. It was called in ancient Egyptian language Ta Mit Rehnet, which means the avenue of rams. For the ancient Egyptian believed that the rams protect the temple and its entrances. The ram is one of the features of God Amun Ra. Under the chin of each ram, there is a royal statue of a king, regarding that god Amon, in the figure of a ram, protects the king. Originally, the rams bore the name of Ramesses II. He is the one who constructed them. Then King Pai Najm I, son of Baanchi, who is one of the pharaohs of the 21st dynasty, recorded his name on some of the statues. These rams were placed all the way till the second pylon, in Karnak, which was the first at its time. But the kings who ruled later, and constructed in the open court in front of it, removed the rams to both sides of the court. The first pylon in Karnak is considered the biggest front of any religious building in the world. Its length is 113 meters, its height is 40 meters, and it's 15 meters thick. The pylon belongs to King Nekta Nebo I, one of the 30th dynasty's pharaohs, and although it was never completed, there could have been no other greater entrance to it than King Ramesses II's Avenue of Rams.
The pylons of any temple in ancient Egypt were decorated with flat poles that were fixated in the vertical niches that were intended for them in the front part of the pylons. Their numbers differed from one pylon to another according to the size of the pylon and its enormousness. A small pylon was decorated with two flag poles made of cedar wood or cypress, ending by colored flags. But in the most of the facades of great pylons, they increase to four and sometimes reach eight in number in giant pylons. In the temple of God Aton in Tel El Amarna, there were ten flagpoles colored in white, green, red, and blue. The purpose of the flagpoles wasn't only the will of decoration, but more importantly, to drive evilness away from this sacred place. The shape of the flag and its pole is the same syllable of the word netter which means God. So they were the Egyptians who invented the flag at the dawn of history. In the beginning, it was composed of a long stick that ended with a stand. Above the stand, there was a statue symbolizing a particular city. Later on, both the stand and the statue were replaced by a piece of cloth that had the same symbol painted on it. On the top of the facade of the pylon, there are openings depending on the number of the flags. For example, in Karnak there are eight openings, four on each side. They were consecrated for fixing and tying the wooden columns of the flags that used to be raised up during the festivals. Building great pylons like that of Karnak Temple isn't a mystery by all means. The matka foldings, which were used to transport and drag the stones for construction, are found surrounding the pylon. They were cleared off and removed at the northern tower and west to the southern tower. But the Egyptian organization of antiquities left the scaffoldings of the eastern side of the southern tower as an example of that simple yet almost miraculous work. Modern technology stands humble in front of the wonders of the ancient Egyptians that carry the breeze of the past and make us enjoy it till today. The first pylon of Karnak Temple is a facade of the House of Amon, which area reaches 60 acres of land. The enclosure walls can easily include 10 European cathedrals, medium in size. The length of the temple from east to west is 113 square meters. It's wide enough to house the Cathedral of St. Peter in Rome, the Cathedral of Milan, plus the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris, all together. The wealth of the god is proportional to his great temple. Amon owned 5,164 divine statues, 81,322 followers and priests, 421,262 head of a cattle, 433 gardens and vineyards, 691,334 acres of land, 83 boats, 46 barns, and 65 cities. Besides, he received constant donations and income from the people. They were composed of gold, silver, copper, cloth, birds, oil, wine, vegetables, and fruits of all kinds. Thus, 
The income of Ammon was never influenced by the events that varied from time to time and affected the people or the king. In matter of fact, it was even bigger than the income of the king himself and the great pylons stand witness to that prosperity. festivals of the ancient Egyptians were celebrated in the open court of grand temples like Karnak. This court, which dates back to the 22nd dynasty, is called the Bubastian's court. For the Libyan kings of that dynasty situated their capital in Bubastis in the north of Egypt. It's 80 meters long and 100 meters wide. The Egyptians gave that court more than one name. The first is Weba, which means the fraud court. The second is Weshet Hefet Her, which means the front hall. The third is Weshet Habit, and it means the hall of the festivals. Right on the left side of the entrance, there are three sandstone chapels built by King Seti II who ruled in the 19th dynasty. They were dedicated to the tried gods of the temple, Amon, Mut and Khonso. The chapel in the middle belongs to Amon. That's where his boat rested over an altar. The one on the left side was for the bark of his wife, Goddess Mut. As for the one on the right, it was for his son Khonso, the moon god. According to the scenes on the walls of Amun's chapel, his sacred boats front and back had the head of the ram, which is a symbol of god Amun in Thebes, wearing four colors of gold. King Seti II stands presenting offerings to god Amun and his family. The figure of the body behind the king is a symbol of Luxor city itself which was called Waset at that ancient time. Its symbol is a sculpture above the head of the lady. The name of King Seti II is carved over and over next to each other in a deep sunk relief. The figure of God Set, the jackal-headed god, which is part of the pharaoh's name, appeared to be destroyed, probably by the followers of Amun. <laughs> 